Hong Kong police arrested a total of 10 people, including media tycoon Jimmy Lai on Monday, causing backlash from the West. In the Inner Mongolia region, a tornado tore down 150 tents of a tourist site and injured over 30 people. Twitter is reportedly in talks with TikTok over a potential deal, but whether the company can afford the deal is in question. Taiwan received the first U.S. minister to visit in decades. The CCP is not happy. Military threats followed, but there seems to be no sign of a comeback. And a post on Chinese social media was blocked by authorities. It read a box of altogether five small dogs. The innocent post was blocked for an unusual reason. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Mayhem in Hong Kong today. Police arresting entrepreneur and media tycoon Jimmy Lai. Over 100 police officers swept through the newsroom of his media company immediately after the arrest. A Hong Kong media tycoon, Jimmy Lai, was arrested Monday morning under the region's new national security law. It's the highest profile arrest yet under the legislation. Hong Kong police arrested Lai and six other men. The official charged a suspicion of collusion with a foreign country or external elements to endanger China's national security. Lai is supportive of the region's pro-democracy movement. He remains one of the few Hong Kong elite willing to be openly vocal about protecting Hong Kong's freedoms. He is 71 years old. Lai's two sons were also apprehended. Lai founded Next Digital, the media that publishes the widely read Apple Daily, a newspaper known for its critical coverage of the Chinese communist regime. It has also criticized the Hong Kong government during the past year of protests. After the arrest, a mass crowd of at least 100 police officers swept through the newsroom of Apple Daily. Police also allegedly searching the home of Lai and his sons. Hong Kong residents expressed worries that the arrest will negatively impact press freedom in the region. I don't think the police should be doing this. After all, this is a media organization, isn't it? Hong Kong claims to have freedom of the press, doesn't it? So I don't think they should search the media's premises. Hong Kong legislator Eddie Chu posted on Twitter that the crime committed by Jimmy Lai was operating a free press. Hong Kong police also arrested the first foreign journalists under the new law. Freelance journalist Wilson Lee was working with Britain's ITN. Beijing imposing sanctions on 11 U.S. citizens over their stances on Hong Kong. The 11 include legislators. It's retaliation for similar measures by Washington against Hong Kong officials on Friday. Among those targeted are Senators Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, Tom Cotton, Josh Hawley and Pat Toomey and Representative Chris Smith. All have been vocal critics of a new national security law that Beijing imposed on Hong Kong in late June. Hong Kong police arrested a total of 10 people, including Jimmy Lai, causing backlash from the West. Meanwhile, new media reporting policies are imposed on the region, allowing only so-called trusted media to get close to the scene. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo wrote on Twitter that he is deeply troubled by reports of the arrest of Jimmy Lai, saying the move is further proof that the CCP has eviscerated Hong Kong's freedoms. Also commenting on Lai's arrest, the U.S. Congress's China Commission called the move intended to intimidate the media Beijing cannot control. Several U.S. senators had criticism for the arrest. Senator Josh Hawley tweeted, This is the free speech China wants to force on the world. The stock price of Apple Daily's Next Digital soared to a record high of 344% at around 2 p.m. on Monday. The stock eventually closed at 183% surge. A local journalist tweeted that Hong Kongers are apparently supporting Apple Daily with money. The others arrested on Monday include high-profile democracy activist Agnes Chow. The 23-year-old is a former member and founder of Hong Kong political party Demosisto, together with Joshua Wong and Nathan Law. She was charged with inciting secession. Monday also marks the arrest of the first foreign media worker in Hong Kong under the national security law. Freelancer Wilson Lee for British Media ITV was taken by police on charge of colluding with foreign forces. ITV said they are concerned to hear of his arrest and are urgently seeking clarification from authorities. Also arrested was activist Andy Lee, a member of an election monitoring group who organized Western experts to observe Hong Kong's district council election last year. 
The same day, Hong Kong's police force rolled out a so-called approved media policy. When police raided Apple Daily's office, the police press team stopped the reporters of many major Western outlets from getting close to the building. Local media, Stan News, and entity sister media, the Epoch Times, were also barred from reporting. Police Commissioner Chris Tong confirmed the new policy that from now on, only trusted media can enter the scene to cover news. Hong Kong's Journalists Association said the large-scale search of the Apple Daily's office was unprecedented and unheard of in Hong Kong. We urge the police to stop the search. This act is destroying press freedom in Hong Kong. Eight local journalist organizations issued a joint statement saying they were shocked with the situation and asking for the police to show legal reasons for their action. Beijing on Monday said they support the Hong Kong government. Major banks in Hong Kong are increasing their scrutiny of customers following U.S. sanctions on top city officials. The U.S. sanctioned 11 officials last Friday, including Hong Kong's leader Carrie Lam, for imposing the national security law. Under these sanctions, banks are forbidden from doing business with them. But if banks follow their order, they could be violating the national security law, which says no sanctions can be applied to Hong Kong or mainland China. Hong Kong Central Bank has shrugged off the U.S. sanctions, saying there's no obligation for local banks to comply. Despite that, Standard Chartered, DBS Bank, HSBC and Hang Sen Bank all issued statements saying they would comply with the sanction laws from the U.S., U.N. and E.U. The Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance, composed of the U.S., Britain, Australia, Canada and New Zealand, slammed Hong Kong's decision to postpone its elections. In a joint statement, the alliance said they were gravely concerned by the city's move, calling it unjust. They demanded that Hong Kong hold the elections as soon as possible and restore the eligibility of the previously disqualified candidates, all of whom are from pro-democracy groups. That's so Hong Kongers can exercise their democratic rights and freedoms as enshrined in the basic law. U.S. Health Secretary Alex Azar offering President Trump strong support for Taiwan today. He told the nation's president Tsai Ing-wen that her government's response to the pandemic was among the world's best. U.S. Health Chief Alex Azar met with Taiwan's leader on Monday and offered the island President Donald Trump's strong support. Azar's visit is a landmark meeting. He's the highest level U.S. official to go to Taiwan in four decades. During his visit, Azar praised Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen and her government's response to the global pandemic as among the world's best. Again, I am grateful to President Tsai for welcoming us to Taiwan, and I look forward to using this visit to convey our admiration for, ta for Taiwan and to learn about how our shared democratic values have driven success in health. Meanwhile, Tsai told Azar his visit represented a huge step forward in anti-pandemic collaborations between our countries, specifically mentioning vaccine and drug research and production. Taiwan is currently not a member of the WHO due to China's objections, a decision which Tsai criticized again on Monday. I would like to reiterate that political consideration should never take precedence over the right to health. The decision to bar Taiwan from participating in the WHA is a violation of the universal right to health. Washington first broke off official ties with Taipei in 1979 in favor of Beijing. Now we turn to the Chinese Communist Party or CCP's reaction to the U.S. support. The Chinese regime has strongly condemned Azar's visit to Taiwan. According to Taiwanese newspaper China Times, Chinese Air Force fighter jets were detected entering Taiwan's southwest airspace briefly last week. That's before Azar's meeting with Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen. The same jets intruded into Taiwan's airspace again on Monday in an apparent show of force. Taiwan responded to the CCP's apparent threats, affirming that China has no position to interfere in Taiwan-U.S. relations. Taiwan Foreign Ministry spokeswoman O oh Jiang'an declared that the CCP has never ruled Taiwan for a single day and has no authority to speak on behalf of the Taiwanese people on the international stage.
O also asserted that the CCP should look at itself before blaming other countries. From the virus cover-up to suppressing its own people, from the anti-extradition movement to its national security law in Hong Kong, and from the abuse of Tibetans to Xinjiang's Uyghurs, she stated people see them all. Amid China's aggression, the U.S. military support for Taiwan is growing. It's currently negotiating the sale of at least four sophisticated aerial drones to Taiwan for the first time. And as for China's northern Inner Mongolia region, a tornado hit the yurts, or traditional tents, of a tourist center on Sunday. The storm left destruction in its wake, as many of the structures collapsed after or during the storm. According to the visitor center staff, about 150 yurts were torn down by the tornado. Over 30 people were injured, including tourists, attendants and other staff members. The employee dormitory was also razed to the ground. Even the glass windows of a bus were found to have shattered. Part of a Chinese palace's walls collapsed over the weekend. That's after heavy rain drenched the city of Xi'an, where the palace is located. During the accident, a bus and several cars were struck by bricks and trees. Four people sustained minor injuries. Known as the Mingqing Palace, the structure was built 600 years ago. But according to local media, the collapsed wall was not part of the original wall. Instead, it was built in recent years to protect the original wall. But that's not the only weather-related trouble China endured over the weekend. On Sunday, China's emergency management department issued a warning for multiple kinds of natural disasters for the next three days. Among them, heavy rain, strong winds, hail, mountain flooding and landslides. At-risk areas include the southwestern provinces of Yunnan, Guizhou and Sichuan. One day before in southern China, authorities in Anhui province issued various warnings for possible mountain torrents. A local captured a clip before the flooding began. He said the flow of water on the street was so heavy that it was difficult just to walk through. Elsewhere in Sichuan province, floods also hit the city of Guangyuan. Streets were seen turning into rivers, with water coming up to the doors of some cars. The list of taboo words used for internet censorship in China has reached a ridiculous extent. A blogger called Beagle Dog Victims Alliance posted a notice on Chinese social media platform Weibo to ask people to adopt abandoned dogs. In it, one sentence read, a box of altogether five small dogs. But this notice was judged by authorities to be in violation of regulations and prohibited from posting. The blogger was puzzled and asked netizens for help. One user posted a comment reminding him that if the words dog and communist are put together, it will be considered using a curse word to describe the communist party. The abbreviation of communist is also the same as the Chinese word altogether. That's why the otherwise innocent sounding post was blocked. The blogger later reposted the notice, this time replacing the sensitive word with an asterisk. And it worked. There are also other words that are not to be paired with the word communist. For example, donkey or bandit. It said if the words communist bandit are written together, the blogger may be detained for five to ten days. China-U.S. relations have recently taken an even step or turn for the worse. The U.S. has imposed all-encompassing sanctions on the Chinese regime. U.S. Secretary of State Pompeo and other politicians have issued messages condemning the CCP, marking the beginning of global pressure on the party. At the same time, Beijing's response has become increasingly weak. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi suddenly stopped the country's so-called wolf warrior style of diplomacy. He's instead adopted a softer tone, saying the U.S. and China should restart dialogue. Radio Free Asia received news that Chinese authorities recently notified the country's internet censorship workers, commonly known as the 50 Cent Army, to stop attacking American leaders and the democratic system on social media. The notice says if the workers use offensive or insulting language against the U.S. online, their bonuses will be deducted and disciplinary action will be taken. 
China's 50-cent army, frequently classified as internet trolls, work for the regime by posting online messages to influence public opinion. The nickname 50 cent or 70 cent is ridicule in itself, as workers are paid 50 cents or 70 cents per propaganda post they make. Now we take a look at TikTok. Twitter has reportedly approached Chinese developer ByteDance, TikTok's parent company, about the possibility of acquiring the app's U.S. operations. TikTok, the wildly popular video sharing app, is now at the center of the debate. The White House says the app could put its American users' personal information in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. Last week, President Trump ordered the app to find a U.S. buyer within 45 days or else it will be banned. Microsoft is already in talks with buying parts of TikTok's U.S. operations and the company is considered the front runner in bidding for the app. It's unclear whether Twitter can afford the deal. TikTok's U.S. operations are estimated to be worth tens of billions of dollars. Twitter's market capitalization stands at around $30 billion. The company would need additional capital to fund the deal. That's as TikTok is reportedly planning to retaliate against the U.S. ban threat. A report from NPR said the app is seeking to sue the Trump administration and could file a federal lawsuit as soon as Tuesday. NPR reported that the lawsuit would argue that the president's executive order is unconstitutional because it didn't give TikTok time to respond. But a suit against the U.S. government filed by a Chinese company isn't unprecedented. In 2019, the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, designated Chinese tech conglomerate Huawei and ZTE as national security risks. The department then barred rural carriers from using federal subsidies to buy equipment from them. Huawei later tried to overturn the ban and sued the FCC. The lawsuit was dismissed within three months. Tencent records its biggest loss over two days as it becomes the latest target in the U.S. security clampdown. Chinese tech company Tencent recorded a $66 billion two-day loss from Friday. It followed America's move to ban the company's WeChat app. Stock fell 4.8 percent Monday, creating a cumulative drop of 9.2 percent over two days. The worst drop for WeChat since 2011. Tech stocks in Hong Kong led declines in the region Monday, with the Hang Seng Tech Index falling as much as 3.6 percent. The sector was also among the weakest performers in China, with the Chinex Index dropping as much as 2 percent. Suppliers to Apple computers saw some of the biggest declines. U.S. sanctions on Huawei are taking effect. A company executive says it's running out of chips for smartphone production. And its upcoming Mate 40 could be the last Huawei smartphone to feature its own chip. Huawei says it's running out of smartphone chips because of U.S. sanctions. The company's consumer unit president Richard Yu said production of its most advanced chips will stop September 15th. And he said the company is unable to make its own chips. Last year, Washington cut off Huawei's access to U.S. components. And in May, the Trump administration barred vendors around the world from using U.S. tech to make components for Huawei. You said this year might be the last generation of Huawei Karen high-end chips because chip producers stopped accepting orders after the second round of sanctions. Now Huawei has no chips and no supply for smartphone production. The Trump administration, the Federal Communications Commission and others have labeled Huawei a national security threat. A former Chinese military engineer founded Huawei in 1987. Huawei denies allegations it helps the Chinese regime spy on users. But under Chinese law, all citizens and organizations must help with national intelligence efforts. U.S. National Intelligence found cyber attacks targeting U.S. elections. They say the Chinese regime is increasing its influence with the aim of preventing Donald Trump's re-election. National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien said the Chinese Communist Party is targeting U.S. election infrastructure with cyber attacks. Speaking on CBS's Face the Nation, O'Brien said the cyber attacks from the Chinese regime add to those coming from countries like Russia and Iran. O'Brien said hackers are targeting Secretary of State websites that are linked to offices that handle elections at the local level. He said the Chinese don't want the president re-elected, calling it a real concern for the U.S.'s free and fair elections. 
He said it is irrelevant whether it is targeting President Trump or presumptive Democratic nominee Joe Joe Biden, but that foreign countries should not influence U.S. elections. Last week, the director of the National Counterintelligence and Security Center made the assessment that Beijing opposes President Trump's re-election. And at Chicago's O'Hare Airport, Customs and Border Protection says it seized more than 1,500 overseas shipments containing nearly 20,000 counterfeit U.S. driver licenses. That's in the first six months of 2020 alone. According to a report, U.S. Customs and Border Protection has seized most of the counterfeit license shipments. The majority came from Hong Kong and mainland China, with a few from South Korea and the U.K., CBP's acting area port director in Chicago, Ralph Picciarilli, called the counterfeits very realistic. He said criminal organizations use these counterfeit IDs to avoid attracting attention to their illegal activities, adding that the fakes can lead to disastrous consequences. CBP said most of the fake IDs were made for college-age students. The department further explained that the documents can lead to identity theft, worksite enforcement, critical infrastructure protection, and fraud linked to immigration-related crimes, like human smuggling and human trafficking. Last fall, CBP agents in Kentucky intercepted nearly 3,000 fake U.S. licenses and more than 3,000 blank card stocks for printing counterfeit licenses. The shipment was on its way to New York City. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.